Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Paul Heinbecker on Syria, Iran, and Canada's looming international role. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, the CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, the director of the Walsley School of International Affairs and CG chair of global security. And as usual, I'm pleased to welcome an expert on some aspect of global governance here into the studios at the Center for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo, Ontario. Today, I'm pleased to welcome back uh, Ambassador Paul Heinbecker, who was uh, my very first guest in this <laughs> series a little over a year ago now. And uh, at that time, we talked about your new book um, on Canadian diplomacy right. called Getting Back in the Game. And mm -hmm. I'd like to come back to your book toward the end of this conversation. Right. But in the meantime, perhaps we can start with your thoughts about uh, what's been brewing right. in crisis points around the world, specifically right. Syria and Iran, and how mm -hmm. Canada looks to be Mm -hmm. playing a role in managing or possibly aggravating those <laughs> crisis situations. <laughs> uh, Start perhaps with Syria. So it's been a very active file and Canada has been um, surprisingly uh, active on the diplomacy side, but not so active in other respects. Well, Syria is a tough, a tough question. Uh, uh, most fundamentally, it uh, raises the issues of the responsibility to protect uh, which was a Canadian-born idea, Canadian made in Canada idea, uh, adopted by the UN. It was it was basically the principle under which the intervention in Libya took place, and uh, we now have a situation where uh, uh, which which is meeting the criteria of the responsibility to protect. Probably, certainly, uh, where the UN is now talking about uh, 7,500 people having been killed. Uh, the government uh, can't protect, won't protect, and in fact is the perpetrator of much of the damage that, which is taking place there. 7,500 people killed, uh, the Syrian military being used uh, to attack uh, civilian areas, not only civilians in those areas, but uh, we can see from the news accounts uh, uh, of the destruction that's going on, the number of uh, of innocents who are being killed, the number of children who are being killed, the, the, the absolutely brutal, brutal is not a strong enough word for the kind of behavior that we're seeing out of the Syrian forces. Children being tortured uh, uh, in, in order to, I suppose, uh, cow, uh, intimidate their, their families and others. It's a brutality at a level that's, uh, that is really shocking. So if you're talking about the, the criteria of the responsibility to protect, certainly we're, not, we're at the point now where I think we can take the view that there is widespread uh, uh, killing taking place. It's not apprehended anymore, but it's, you could, it's apprehended in the sense that m more can, can well happen. Uh, there is historical precedent. Uh, this, this looks very much like what Assad's father did uh, in Hama uh, you know, back in the 80s in which he effectively put down uh, a kind of an insurrection by destroying uh, a lot of people. It looks like that's the same game plan we're seeing. He's not being, uh, he's, he's not being restrained or uh, he's not listening to uh, his Arab, the Arab countries, uh, uh, s none of whom are supporting him now. His support, the only support he seems to have is uh, active support is from Iran and, and Russia, uh, and Russia for reasons which are not clear to me, except it's kind of the old-fashioned religion, the old-time religion. Russia hasn't got any more client states left in the Middle East. This is the only one. Russia uses a base there. Russia sells weapons. None of these things are worthy of a superpower like Russia. That shouldn't, these kind of motivations are important, but they shouldn't be de decisive, I don't think. Uh, and 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 the Russians don't seem to be calculating what the rest of us are coming to think of them for supporting the Syrian regime. We're seeing a bit more uh, flexibility, I think, from the Chinese, and maybe the Russians will come around to it. Uh, Kofi Annan is now involved. This is, uh, I think, if Kofi Annan can't bring about a solution to this issue, a diplomatic solution to this issue, then there isn't going to be one because he's, uh, he is undoubtedly the most experienced person there is to be doing this. Uh, he has the backing of the Arab countries. He has the backing of the United Nations, including one imagines the Chinese and the and the Russians. And uh, so his intervention is is extremely important. Uh, that said, uh, the Syrians uh, are are certainly in a 
find, feel themselves to be in a kill or be killed kind of situation. Uh, they, they, you know, there's, there's, they're not, uh, they're not prepared to yield uh, to anybody, uh, and uh, they think that they're, at least the regime and possibly their own heads depend on prevailing. So, the chances of this getting still bloodier uh, are very good. Now, Russia and China did veto a UN resolution they that did. would. That wouldn't have done much, right? It was no. more or less a, endorse a Arab League right. um, name and shame and push for a resolution. Nobody's actually talking, at least within government circles, about a responsibility to protect, and everybody has signaled that there's no enthusiasm for a Libya-style action on the basis of Yeah, that. part of that is, I mean, f frankly, uh, you have a U.S. election going on. Uh, this is an election year in the United States. The president wants to run in part on bringing the boys home, bringing them home from, uh, from Iraq already and with the promise of bringing them home from Afghanistan. He doesn't want that, uh, that message to the American people to be confused by an, another message that he's going to war in Syria. Uh, I think that's one of the major considerations. I think that the Syrians are, a, are a, the Syrian military is a tougher proposition than the Libyan military was ever going to be. It's a, it's a bigger country, more people, much more equipment, many more tanks, many more heavy weapons. Some weapons of mass destruction they, in terms of chemicals and, and possibly biological weapons. And so uh, the getting, in, getting involved militarily uh, seems likely to be more costly. But, you know, uh, one of the things that's happened uh, in, the, in the last uh, 15 or 20 years, there's been uh, since, since the first uh, Gulf War, we're seeing the influence of technology on warfare. And uh, we've had two interventions, one in Kosovo uh, and uh, the other more recently in Libya, in, in which the intervening side has not so much as broken a fingernail. The, these, these conflicts have been won uh, from the air, uh, the ground work being done by local local forces, local yeah. forces. but the interveners have have effectively been able to do that at, at no human cost, and have been able to uh, and and their their capacity for doing it by using drones is only getting greater. Uh, the, so at a certain point, uh, I think the decisive thing is is fundamentally the American election. If the, if, if the election was not on, if the pri president was not in such a difficult uh, uh, campaign, uh, and, if he, you know, and, if, and if he want, didn't need to be able to show himself of having a, you know, a, a, a kind of a circumspect foreign policy in which he's, not, uh, in which he's uh, bringing the troops home, I think we might see a, a greater willingness to do something there. Maybe a little later in the year. Maybe. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, the CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So Paul, the other Thank big you. hot uh, topic in the area is Iran. And Iran. Sanctions have been tightened. Um, mm -hmm. Life is getting difficult in the streets right. of Iran. Uh, there's been a lot of beating of drums. Uh, Israel is um, signaling that it is at least willing to consider mm -hmm. unilateral action to try to delay, if not uh, destroy, which is impossible, the Iranian nuclear program. Mm -hmm. And uh, Iran's been threatening to close the Straits of Hormuz to oil shipments, if necessary, to try to open mm -hmm. up the oil pipelines again. So uh, how do you see First of all, how do you see the Iran situation evolving in the short term, but especially in light of the fact that there's an additional drama unfolding in Syria? And those two countries are, are tightly mm -hmm. interlinked. And are, yeah. It's not exactly the same problem, but they're, they're very uh, closely associated with problems. Well, the, uh, the fundamental question is whether, whether Iran gets the bomb or Israel or the United States bombs Iran, uh, and which is, uh, whether those are the only two alternatives there are. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and if they were the only two alternatives, which would, be, which would produce a, the, a worse outcome? Uh, I'm strongly of the view that uh, attacking Iran is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is taking an enormous risk, that uh, it would cause uh, upset uh, all over the Middle East and, and well beyond, especially if, and would, as would be the case, uh, 
uh, even an Israeli attack on Iran would be interpreted by the Iranians and, and by the rest of the Muslim world as an American-supported Israeli attack on Iran. I think there's a fairly serious chance that, the, uh, that an Israeli action would drag the Americans into a war they don't want to be in. They're in an election year. Uh, they, they don't want to, to have that war. They may not want to have that war in any circumstance, but they certainly don't want to have it uh, on the eve of an election. Uh, so I think that the, 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 the Israelis are setting up time frames by which action must be taken about the existence of weapons uh, and so on. And I must say it reminds me of uh, my experience at the UN. It reminds me of the Iraq war. There we were told uh, that military action was necessary because of the uh, weapons of mass destruction that uh, Saddam Hussein had. The evidence for that was poor. Uh, the world went ahead, or the Americans and the British went ahead uh, and, uh, and attacked anyway. And we, we, and, and we saw the enormous price the Americans had paid as a consequence in terms of their international reputation, in terms of the loss of life of Americans, in terms of the loss of life of many, many more Iraqis. Mm -hmm. So these, these are wars. These are not surgical operations. We're not playing war games here. We're not, uh, you know, it's not something that operates on a, on a, on a you know, uh, you, you do out of your basement. No, as you know, war games are part of the planning process, yeah. the option evaluation yes. process. Yes. And yeah. My understanding from everyone I've spoken mm -hmm. to is that nobody has played a war game mm -hmm. uh, involving an attack on Iran that actually has a positive outcome for anybody involved in the attack in Iran, neither the United States right. nor Israel. So the, the military argument so far is, is nil. Yeah. And, and, the, and, the, and the Israelis themselves, uh, judging by uh, what I read in Israeli newspapers, are themselves divided on the, on the wisdom of this. Uh, and they are, they, there's a, uh, in the cabinet, uh, there are those who believe that whatever, uh, that they, they can carry out enough, do enough damage to the uh, uh, Iranian uh, nuclear program that it would be worthwhile and that any Ura Iranian response would be tolerable. And there are others who, who think that, uh, who are not so confident about the first uh, and are even less confident about the second. And in all of this, there's a calculation also that, uh, you know, where do the, what do the American people think in this? Uh, the, uh, how would, if, if the American people uh, concluded that they had been dragged into a war that they, that mean they might not have had to be part of, how are they going to react to that? How is, what kind of, uh, what's that going to mean for the American-Israeli relationship? I think there are enormous stakes uh, in play here. And I think that uh, it's, uh, you know, the countries who pre present themselves as friends of the Israelis really, I think, ought to be counseling circumspection here. The Israeli argument is, you know, people drag up the, the, uh, the argument from uh, Second World War if, uh, you know, if, the, if, if Hitler had been stopped uh, early enough, uh, none of the, none of the, f none of the, of, of the tragedy uh, would have happened, particularly the Holocaust wouldn't have happened. Um, but it's always dangerous in my mind to be drawing his historical analogies. Nothing is always the same. Nothing is s similar enough. I think the situation we're in is that you have basically a failed state in, or a failing state in Iran. I think the sanctions are making a difference. Um, but, uh, and there's, you know, the, 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 if, if you're able to, if you were able to contain and to deter Stalin, who had killed scores of millions of people in the Second World War, somebody as crazy as that, if you were able to deter the Chinese um, uh, in the, in the, under Mao, uh, it isn't obvious to me why you can't deter the Iranians. Why the Iranians, who have not so far in recent years, and at least uh, overtly attacked uh, anybody would uh, would shift gears and become that kind of threat. I think the uh, I, th I think that the the dangers uh, to uh, uh, to the Middle East, the dangers to the international economy. Um, you know, it isn't. Uh, people talk about the the Straits of Hormuz being blocked. 
if you can block the Straits of Hormuz even temporarily uh, and the 20 percent of the oils, of the oil, world's oil that flows through there, uh, it's not obvious to me why you couldn't, why uh, attacks wouldn't be possible on, on the Saudi oil fields, for example. Mm -hmm. the people are sort of counting on the Saudis to pump the extra oil that would make it okay and, and would reduce the economic impact. Maybe they won't be able to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, uh, but I think in terms of the, of there being yet one more military conflict between the West and a Muslim country, I think that that's an incalculable uh, negative. I think that the, uh, you know, we, we, we considered the war uh, in Iraq to be a, a recruiting uh, effort uh, for, for Al-Qaeda. I think we would see that again. Uh, you know, there are 1.3 billion uh, 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 Muslims. If you, if you radicalize 1% of them through this, that gives you 13 million terrorists. That's a, that's a war you can't win. So I think the smart thing to do here is to think about deterrence, to think about containment, put the emphasis on diplomacy, to press ahead with the sanctions, uh, but not to take the position that there will be an attack one way or another mm -hmm. on Iran because I fear that the consequences will be worse. Very good. We'll be back with Paul Heinbecker in just a moment. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Just to mm -hmm. follow up a bit more yeah. on the Iranian uh, story, mm -hmm. uh, there's no urgency. There's no apparent urgency. We know that Iran has a program. We don't have a lot of detail about uh, the program. They claim it's for civilian uses. Mm -hmm. Almost right. certainly it's not. Uh, but we do know based on the experience of other regimes that had similar kinds of programs that they tend to bluff and bluster and make grandiose claims about progress. and. At the end of the day, don't don't have very good quality programs that are much slower or even completely ineffective in attaining a, mm -hmm. a goal. Very very insightful piece on this by Jacques Hyman's in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists mm -hmm. recently. And if and if that analysis is right, this is not a looming urgent prospect. At the same time, somebody uh, we think Israel or the Americans, maybe both, have actually been doing quite a lot behind mm -hmm. the scenes to try to delay whatever mm -hmm. program Iran has, the right. Stuxnet virus, targeting mm -hmm. centrifuges, targeted assassinations in right. the streets. It's almost as though you could tell a very strongly positive story about the need to do nothing, about just sort of watch and wait and see how things unfold in the Iranian domestic scene. Well, uh, I, I think that that's right. Uh, you know, if you were an Israeli, uh, and if you consider the history of the Jews and the history of the Holocaust, it's not surprising that people don't you know, are saying never again, uh, and they don't want to be in a position where uh, you, you know they are uh, that kind of uh, that kind of those kinds of atrocities can be perpetrated again. Uh, that's more than understandable. The, the difficulty is they face, I think, is a judgment about what which, what's going to be effective. Um, and n no one seems to believe uh, that an attack on the Iranian nuclear facilities would deter Iran uh, uh, from producing uh, a nuclear weapons program. Um, and if you look at the uh, intelligence, uh, the, the best intelligence there seems to be, the U.S. National Intelligence Estimate, uh, there was a one, uh, a declassified version in 2007, and that's been followed up by some other uh, documents and, uh, and also by statements by, by um, leading American intelligence officials, including the head of the, the CIA and, and, the, uh, and the U.S. Department of Defense, that they don't think that the, uh, these Iranians have made a decision to give themselves nuclear weapons. They think that they are working on developing a capability for doing that, but that they're not actually developing a weapon. And that's a, that's a position that they, that they're, they're, uh, you know, that they, they took in, in 2007, and they're maintaining that position based on what they know. I'm always a little bit of skeptic of, of, of uh, intelligence because I know that uh, intelligence can get overinterpreted, it can miss things, uh, it can add two and two and get 20. Uh, you have to be very careful about that. But I think if you looked at the situation as dispassionately as you can now, uh, you would, I think uh, you would come to the conclusion that you should keep the pressure on diplomatically on the Iranians. Uh, 
uh, you should try to f find some sort of diplomatic way forward, and, uh, uh, and I think that that's possible as the Iranian economy comes under more and more, more pressure from, from the sanctions. But that you should not t take the, the view that it's sort of now or never in terms of a military attack. It may be now or never for the Israelis. It may not be. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure uh, what the facts are on that circumstance. The Israelis talk about a zone of, of, of immunity uh, that would be created once the Iranians put their n nuclear capabilities further underground. That would not be the case uh, from the, the perspective of the Americans, and it may not even be the case from the perspective of the Israelis, mm -hmm. uh, depending on, on how that intervention might be done. So I think giving yourself these kind of time frames, this also reminds me of what we, what we saw in, uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in the war against Iraq, where we, uh, we were told that the war had absolutely to be started before the end of March because it became too hot to fight, there were sandstorms. And what did we see? Well, we saw the Americans stay on for seven more summers uh, fighting an insurgency. So the idea that you couldn't fight in those conditions which was preposterous anyway, because they fought all the way through okay. Vietnam, which were the condi conditions were at least as bad. Uh, so be, my judgment is to be very careful about setting uh, arbitrary deadlines that, uh, that, that, that uh, may very well turn out to be, uh, uh, to force your hand, but not necessarily to be real. Um, and force your hand in a, in a political sense. So we have the situation where there, uh, the IAEA report uh, and the IAEA is expressing suspicion of Iranian uh, uh, activities. The Iranians are not allowing the IAEA to see some of those activities. Um, uh, but no one in the IAEA has said that there is a nuclear, Iranian nuclear weapon. Uh, the Americans are not saying there's an Iranian nuclear weapon. And what they are saying is that there is a, there is a kind of a a program to give themselves the capability of producing a weapon. I think so long as we're at that level, the rationale for an attack, I think, is, is, uh, is and considering the consequences, the probable consequences. I hear people saying, well, it wouldn't be so bad, it would be surgical, or it wouldn't be so bad, the Iranians would not react, uh, I think, uh, would not react vigorously. I don't know who is interpreting the Iran uh, who who's making those kind of judgments, because I don't think we know enough about how the Iranians would, would respond. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, they wouldn't respond in a way that was that that brought about the, their destruction. There wouldn't be any kind of a, an attack on Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, we I don't think you can predict how that's going to happen. And I think that the the difficulty the that the Israelis face, frankly, is that. If they were to launch an attack, and if the retaliation was against the United States primarily, as it might well be, the American troops in Afghanistan, American shipping in the Gulf, American interests in the Gulf, American interests around the world, uh, that will have a geopolitical consequence that I think the Israelis really need to really mm, need will. to think about. We'll be back once more with Paul Heinbecker. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So I said at the beginning I'd mm -hmm. like to come back to mm -hmm. your book, which helped right. us launch this podcast series. And at the time, yeah. you were making the argument that Canada had essentially gotten out of the game of right. uh, international politics. And mm -hmm. looking back over the past uh, more than a year now at Canadian foreign policy, I wonder whether you think uh, at least the government of Canada thinks that it is getting back in the game, and if so, in what way? It, we, we've seen a very active Canadian role in, in Libya. Mm -hmm. uh, a government likes to think of itself more as a hard security contributor to, to global security rather than a soft security contributor. Uh, interesting role in Syria because we've mm -hmm. been involved with the Friends of Syria Summit mm -hmm. and we are implicated in the Israeli-U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, relationship on the issue because we're so overtly pro-Israeli. Mm -hmm. And um, remains to be seen about our possible role in the Iran crisis. But is there a pattern? Is are, are we getting back in the game? And is it in a way that you think would be beneficial to the interests of Canada? 
Well, to some extent, y yes, and to some extent, no. Um, my book came out, co coincided as it, as it happened, with the UN Security Council vote, uh, in which, uh, which we lost. Uh, the, the other members... Membership vote. The membership vote. The, the UN members, uh, knowing Portugal was financially bankrupt, preferred Portugal to Canada. And they preferred Portugal to Canada in part because of the policies that we had been following. One of which was the, a, a certain indifference to the UN, I think they, they, uh, they, they perceived. Uh, a, a policy that was very pro-Israeli, uh, uh, the, the most pro-Israeli of any, of any country, uh, without any corresponding uh, gestures towards the interests and the, and, and the, the rights uh, uh, and the suffering of, of the Palestinian people. Climate change, we walked away from our uh, uh, responsibilities. Uh, we haven't put anything in place that really uh, that w would really uh, uh, fill the void. Fill the void. Um, on uh, on Africa, we basically decided uh, and we announced that we weren't uh, very interested in Africa anymore, uh, and uh, shifted our attention to Latin America. So uh, these are uh, all of those things added up to uh, a, a certain way of conducting foreign policy. And, uh, and they were read by the international community uh, accordingly, and the international community uh, was not uh, very impressed by it. I think on the, on the positive side, uh, we've, <coughs> we, we, from that perspective, uh, not everybody would agree with me with this, but I think we stuck with it on Afghanistan as, uh, in, in a way which I think brought, gives us credit. I, I think in, in, uh, in Libya, although we didn't want to mention the responsibility to protect, I think, because this was regarded as a, as a policy of the, of the previous Liberal government, uh, that nonetheless uh, the, the Canadian government did get involved uh, and I think did the right thing in getting involved uh, and played a, an effective role there, just as we had done in Kosovo, by the way. There is a certain amount of, um, I don't know what, how to put it, uh, the idea that, we, that we're shifting from uh, sort of soft power to hard power uh, is really quite, uh, I think, an error. Uh, there's always been hard power and soft power. Soft power is, is, an, uh, is a term that was created by Joe Nye, uh, who had been Deputy Secretary of Defense of the U.S. Uh, of the US and uh, an academic uh, at, um, at, at Harvard. And, it, and, it, and the idea is that you, you have influence in the world and you have power in the world because of your own success. You have a successful society. You have a highly competent uh, uh, military, uh, and but people uh, fundamentally wa would want to emulate you. Uh, you. You get what you want by co-option and not by coercion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The hard power is coercion, soft power is co-option. People see a reason to do the kind of things that you would like them to do because they think it's in their interests. They emulate the kind of policies you follow because they think those policies are successful. They like to have, have to create a situation where the, where the human and, and political and civil rights of people are protected because they think that that works. Uh, so we actually also have soft power. If you look at the, um, at the, the immigration intentions ar uh, of people around the world, we probably are the, the most attractive country. People would, you know, do want to come to Canada. They do see that we have a, a society that's worth emulating. Uh, they do give us a hearing internationally, partly because of who we are and how we handle our domestic situation and how we deal with human rights, how successful we are economically, how good our banks are, uh, our, our banking system is. Um, so but in terms of our international influence and our international mm -hmm. role, I mean, my reading of your book was that the world had more or less watched us squander or withdraw. Well, we, uh, we had, I think we had withdrawn to the sidelines. We had, uh, uh, we, we were not uh, taking a, a, an active uh, role that we could have. Um, Are we what, positioned what, now to? I think we're positioned better now. I think, I think the government's had uh, more time in office. I think they've gone up a learning curve. I think, for example, that the, the relationship with China and the notion that we need to have a strategy for Asia and a strategy for China, I think that that is a, a sign of maturity. I think that we're, you know, the government has recognized that 
uh, the, a kind of bumper sticker approach, bumper sticker mentality approach to a, a, an mm. issue as complicated as China was really not going to serve our interests. So I think that we are we're doing better there. I think that we did well on Libya. Um, I'm not sure that uh, where we stand on Syria, uh, I th uh, the, the government is, uh, is very much aware of how complicated and dangerous intervention in Syria would be. Um, but I don't sense any leadership in those areas so much as I, as I sense, I guess, participation. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not trivial. Uh, I think that that is, is, uh, is, is an important step forward. Um, because there was a kind of a tendency to believe that, you know, poor little Canada, what could we do? Well, it actually turns out we can do quite a bit if we're doing it intelligently and in partnership with other people who are also right. doing it. I think that the, uh, the, the uh, it's one of the, one of the ironies is that had we been on the Security Council through this period, we would have a lot more sound position, a lot more, we'd be able to make a much more constructive contribution to to the issue of Syria because we'd be on the council while yeah. this was being discussed, for example. We'd also be able to have a greater influence. A country like Canada needs to have vehicles. We don't, we don't have a lot of the capacity to act on our own. And one of the vehicles is multilateral organizations, and one of those is the UN and other, another is NATO. Yeah. Um, we need to, we, when, we, when we have those vehicles, we can have a bigger impact than when we don't have. So I think that we're, you know, we lost something by not being on the Security Council, and we haven't recovered it yet. It didn't ever mean, didn't mean then, and it doesn't mean now, that we were somehow out of business. But we put ourselves in a position where it was much more difficult mm -hmm. uh, for yeah, us to have the influence we'd like to have. Yeah, do we see the beginnings of edging back into the... I think we're on our, I think we're coming back, I think, uh, but, uh, but I don't, uh, but, you know, uh, the idea that we're going to come back through uh, military capability alone uh, right. is a mistake. Well, thanks again, as always, Paul, for coming thanks. in and sharing your insights and your expertise. And thanks to our audience for joining us. Join us again next week for another episode of Inside the Issues, the CG Online podcast. You can look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Canadian diplomacy right. called Getting Back in the Game. And mm -hmm. I'd like to come back to your book toward the end of this conversation. Right. But in the meantime, perhaps we can start with your thoughts about uh, what's been brewing right. in the crisis points around the world, specifically right. Syria and Iran, and mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. Canada looks to be mm -hmm. playing a role in managing or possibly aggravating those <laughs> crisis situations. <laughs> start perhaps with Syria. It's, it's been a very active file, and Canada's been. Um, surprisingly uh, active on the diplomacy side, but not so active in other respects. Well, Syria is a tough, a tough question. Uh, most fundamentally, it uh, raises the issues of the responsibility to protect, uh, which was a Canadian-born idea, Canadian made in Canada idea, uh, adopted by the UN. It was, it was basically the principle under which the intervention in Libya took place. And uh, we now have a situation. Support the only support he seems to have is uh, active support is from Iran, and and Russia, uh, and Russia for reasons which are not clear to me, except that it's kind of the old-fashioned religion, the old-time religion. Russia hasn't got any more client states left in the Middle East. This is the only one. Russia uses a base there. Russia sells weapons. None of these things are worthy of a superpower like Russia. That shouldn't these kind of motivations are important, but they shouldn't be de decisive, I don't think. Uh, and, and, and the Russians don't seem to be calculating what the rest of us are coming to think of them for supporting the Syrian regime. We're seeing a bit more uh, flexibility, I think, from the Chinese, and maybe the Russians will come around to it. Uh, Kofi Annan is now involved. This is, uh, I think, if Kofi Annan can't bring about a solution to this issue, a diplomatic solution to this issue, then there isn't going to be one because where, uh, uh, which, which is meeting the criteria of the responsibility to protect, probably. Certainly, uh, where the UN is now talking about uh, 7,500 people having been killed. Uh, the government uh, can't protect, won't protect, and in fact is the perpetrator of much of the damage that, which is taking place there. 7,500 people killed, uh, the Syrian military being used uh, to 
attack uh, civilian areas, not only civilians in those areas, but uh, we can see from the news accounts uh, uh, of the destruction that's going on, the number of, uh, of innocents who are being killed, the number of children who are being killed, the, the, the absolutely brutal, brutal is not a strong enough word for the kind of behavior that we're seeing out of the Syrian forces, children being tortured uh, uh, in order to, I suppose, uh, cow, uh, intimidate their, their families and others. It's a brutality at a level that's, uh, that is really shocking so if you're talking about the, the criteria of the responsibility to protect, certainly we're, not, we're at the point now where I think we can take the view that there is widespread uh, uh, killing taking place. It's not apprehended anymore, but it's, you could, it's apprehended in the sense that m more can, can well happen. Uh, there is historical precedent. Uh, this, this looks very much like what Assad's father did uh, in Hama uh, you know, back in the 80s in which he effectively put down uh, a kind of an insurrection by destroying uh, a lot of people. It looks like that's the same game plan we're seeing. He's not being, uh, he's, he's not being restrained or uh, he's not listening to uh, his Arab, the Arab countries, uh, uh, none of whom are supporting him now. It's Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Paul Heinbecker on Syria, Iran, and Canada's looming international role. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, the CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, the director of the Walsley School of International Affairs and CG Chair of Global Security. And as usual, I'm pleased to welcome an expert on some aspect of global governance here into the studios at the Center for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo, Ontario. Today I'm pleased to welcome back uh, Ambassador Paul Heinbecker, who was uh, my very first guest in this <laughs> series a little over a year ago now. And uh, at that time we talked about your new book, um, 